Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series, facilitated by renowned educators. ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. Um, again, just a little better definition of what risk appetite is. Risk appetite is that environment uh, which you see demand is, is, is basically, you know, just, just rising, sometimes soaring in, in a very hot risk appetite environment. You have rising global demand. Um, that's generally the driver. Uh, if, if, the, if you don't have consumer demand, if you don't have demand for goods and products out there, uh, you don't have a risk appetite environment. This goes along with optimism, growth optimism, all that same type of background. You have fairly loose credit of it, you know, available um, to fund uh, asset growth and demand. Uh, you can't have a continued rise in demand without some funding to allow people to make these purchases of these goods, goods and services. And in general, you're going to have an expanding asset classes, expanding stock markets, uh, emerging markets, commodities markets, things like that. Um, so it's a so things going in the what we consider the right direction up is a risk averse, excuse me risk appetite environment. Making the point here, um, capital capital gains opportunities determine dollars fate in a risk appetite environment. Let me explain that and give you an example. In the last what's called risk appetite environment we saw from 2001 to 2008, uh, the real driver of this was China. Uh, and, the, and China powering the emerging markets, powering Asia. So in this environment, the goal was to get money offshore out into China, basically, out into emerging market mutual funds, out in the commodities that were going to be demanded f from China because of the huge growth they had. So the capital gains opportunities in this environment were outside of the dollar. Therefore, in this environment, the dollar ended up really to be the funding asset. That's not always the case, but it's been the case in this cycle, and it's the one we remember and think that is always will be the case. We had a risk appetite environment back in the early 90s. In that environment, people wanted to get into the U.S., get into the U.S. stock market and access to the NASDAQ. That was a risk appetite environment. Demand was growing. But, the, but because the capital gains opportunities were domestically at that point in time, people bought the dollar in that environment. So we had a dollar bull market uh, when the capital gains opportunities were in the U.S. market. So, so that has to be a consideration because the capital gains opportunities, um, if they are in the U.S., you're going to tend to have uh, a stronger dollar because people are going to want to get in here with hot money and foreign direct investment. Also, in general, because of the, just the environment, asset prices moving up, uh, loose credit, uh, your you know supply constraints growing because of demand, you're going to tend to have an inflationary backdrop environment with risk appetite, which is an important factor uh, in, in really telling you where you are in the global economy. Risk averse, just flip it around. Falling demand, tightening credit, uh, asset classes contracting, um, Stocks falling, commodities falling, emerging markets falling in price. Uh, needless to say, the credit crunch drove this risk appetite environment. Um, and if we just go back for a second, which I failed to mention, in the, in the risk appetite environment, the dollar was the funder here. Dollar-based credit being spread around the globe was the funding asset. U.S. dollar-based credit in derivatives, U.S. dollar-based credit because of the Fed pushing interest rates down to 1% in 2001, which really led to the rocket launch of liquidity around the globe. You implicitly had a government from 2001 to 2008, the U.S. government, uh, you had a government that had an implicit weak dollar policy because they believed um, it was very beneficial to the U.S. and U.S. multinationals and U.S. consumers. The implicit dollar policy said if we use dollar-based credit and spread it around the globe, um, we're going to liquefy global markets, uh, create create demand for our goods, um, create cheaper goods for the U.S., continue this symbiotic relationship with China. They send us very cheap stuff. We send them decreasing uh, value. We send them dollars that continue to decrease in value. Um, so that's part and, part and parcel to that. The reason the game changed because of the credit crunch and the risk aversion environment was the fact that we came at a point in which it made no more sense once the credit crunch really – 
showed its ugly face to push down the dollar in an implicit weak dollar policy because the global credit system was really under attack. It had the dollar been pushed further down at that point in time, um, we could have had a real major debacle and a breakdown in the entire credit system. So uh, there are times in which, if you just think logically of this, um, major government policies change because of major global vac macro events, and that was one of those times. In risk-averse environments, in general, the world reserve currency tends to do well. Uh, one of the things you, you, know, you simply have to look at, if you look at the last, if you count this the sixth, if you look at the last six recessions in the U.S., the U.S. has been the world reserve currency during all those times. The U.S. dollar index has actually outperformed its major competitors during recession. Uh, it just goes to this world reserve currency status as a safe haven status overall in major global declines or recession. And we're seeing it again here. Uh, most people thought this Armageddon in the global economy would mean the dollar thought would fall off the cliff. Just the opposite happened. The world reserve currency played the role of safe haven, people coming back and hiding in the U.S. capital markets. They underestimated the fact that capital flow was the driver of currencies in an environment that we were in. Money had to hide in the U.S. So their scenario, a lot of these forecasters got right on Armageddon coming. They just missed the fact that the dollar uh, benefited because it was a world reserve currency. Also, obviously, with contracting asset markets and tightening credit and falling demand, you're going to tend to have a deflationary backdrop. Um, and we're starting to see that in a big way now. Uh, consumer prices have declined <clears throat> uh, dramatically. Consumer price index. We're now at, at six at changes. And if you look at the consumer price index, six months change to six months change. We're now at levels we haven't seen in terms of declines uh, since the 1930s, and that's a function of this whole deflationary uh, environment you get in ri in a risk in a major risk appetite environment. So keep in mind. I've been talking long term about risk aversion, risk appetite, and risk aversion, but you also see these apply in shorter term time frames. You see these ebbs and flows. You see these. Um, you tend to see these um, <clears throat> bouts of optimism, and we're definitely in one of those right now. Um, so, so although they, they, pr you can primarily see them easier in the long term time frames. We see ebbs and flows of this in the shorter, intermediate term time, frame, time frames. Excuse me. Some people would say uh, we're in the period. Um, those that have our similar outlook that the global economy is still in trouble because of the U.S. consumer still not out of the woods, with housing prices still falling, with un unemployment still rising. We're not quite sure how the U.S. consumer is going to turn around and start spending a lot of money. And if we've learned anything, it's the U.S. consumer is the driver. So what this move we've seen in stock markets and this move in currencies against the U.S. dollar could be considered, uh, and again, we won't know this with hindsight, a bit of a false dawn, false dawn based on a lot of optimism, this idea of green shoots. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.